So we're going to come to part two. We started a, a two-part series as we're going through Romans now in Romans chapter one, the reality of God's wrath. And this is going to be part two. Again, I'm going to read from Romans chapter one, verse 18 through 32. Actually, I'm going to read from 18 to 24, and we're going to cover uh, to verse 32. So the word of our Lord, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools." and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, Father... Something extremely relative, Lord God, uh, a time that this passage, Lord God, describes seems to be the time that we live in, and it at times touches us personally, our lives, our hearts, Lord God, it's in the culture that we are surrounded in, the nation, the world. Oh, Father God, I pray that you would give us illumination through your spirit, give us insight, and Father God, may we walk out of here, Lord, with a heart that desires to live more carefully in thy holiness to thy glory, in obedience, to Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, be seated. Uh, again, very important message, extremely relative to the time we live in, in our lives here in, uh, in, within the culture we're in, the nation we're in. So we are going to focus again, we began last week talking about the wrath of God. Simply, the wrath of God comes because of rejection of Him. Rejection produces rebellion, idolatry. And then rebellion results in a moral rotting within the individual as well as within the culture. It could be within the nation. So I want to give you a review here. The first thing we talked about was wrath. And, and wrath again comes because of rejection. And then rejection produces rebellion and then rebellion again, rottenness. And um, I think that one of the things is the wrath of God is greatly misunderstood. As I said last week, to understand the wrath of God, the wrath of God is a principle. I want you to just again to hear this. It is a principle that operates in the universe. When people sin, there are consequences. Whether you call it uh, the principle of reaping and sowing, uh, the Hindus call it karma, I call it the boomerang effect, right? Whatever comes around goes around. Simply, the wrath of God is a principle that God has established in the universe. He said like a principle like gravity. When somebody jumps out of a building, God isn't there saying, I'm going to really punish you and let you splatter all over the street. That's not how it works. He just simply, you violate the principle, you reap the consequences. And that is the wrath of God. Now, the wrath of God, there are three different aspects to the wrath of God. There is present wrath. And that is when, when a person sins, there is an immediate wrath they're going to experience in their life. Whether they're a Christian or a non-Christian. Then there is future wrath, and future wrath speaks about the wrath that will occur during the tribulation period, Revelation chapter 6 through 19. And then there is eternal wrath, and eternal wrath is hell. It's total 100% separation from God, and all that's good. And then eventually it's poured into the lake of fire. We see that in Revelation chapter 20. The wrath of God occurs because of rejection. And in this passage, it's talking about a specific type of rejection. It's talking about a rejection of the natural revelation of God. And this is, again, where no one has an excuse. Whether they've heard the gospel or not, whether they've heard of Jesus or not, this is talking about all mankind. There is a difference between what is called general revelation and specific revelation. General revelation is the revelation of God that comes through nature. Specific revelation is the revelation that comes through the Bible, and then comes through Jesus. So I, I talked about four types of revelation that we see in, Revel in Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 2. And I'll go through this quickly again. Big words. Cosmological evidence. 
And that is simply the evidence of this vast universe. You've got a you've got hundred, and they say that there would be a hundred billion solar systems like ours in the Milky Way galaxy that we live in. And then there would be 100 billion Milky Way galaxies in the entire universe. Now we understand that from science today, but if you were living back 300 years ago and you looked up, you realize that there is a vast universe around us. And simply, when you see this vast universe, you see this massive effect, your brain naturally then reasons, and we're dealing with reason here, we're not, we're not dealing with specific revelation, just simply reason. And the brain reasons if you have an effect, a massive effect, you must have what? Cause. Yeah, a massive cause. And uh, the cosmological evidence is simply that a person, through the very creation of God around us, they simply reason or deduce that there has to be a great causer. Now, we don't understand him as being personal. Just simply there has to be, and again, you can call it uh, just simply deducing that there is some type of it, a powerful force that created this vast universe. Then you have what is called teleological evidence, and teleological evidence is the idea that there is evidence of design in the universe which suggests a designer. There are principles, laws, uh, maxims uh, that govern the universe, uh, the law of entropy, the law of gravity. You have Einstein's laws, Newton's laws, Hubble's laws, Pascal's laws, you know, all those guys, you discover a law and you get your name, okay, connected to it. They were only the discoverers of the laws. God is the maker of the laws. He is the creator of all these laws. So you have all of these laws, mathematical laws. Thousands and thousands. You Google laws of nature. And I would have loved to have put them up there, but I would have gone through 20 pages, literally. There are so many different laws that have been discovered by scientists that again, when you see all of this design, you then naturally reason there must be a, a designer. Right? When you see a watch with right, its, its little hands and its face and its, its, it, you know, the cabinet that it's in, and you see it taking, you know, it just it, to, the, to the millisecond, you know, a decent watch to the millisecond every year. It keeps perfect time. Then you deduce and you reason there must be what? A yeah, watchmaker, right? So that is the teleological evidence. Then you have ontological evidence. Ontological evidence is simply an internal awareness that God has put within human beings that, he's exist, that he exists. Mankind has this awareness of a supreme, all-powerful intelligence. Okay, I'm not talking again in a personal way. And then you have moral evidence that there is a moral compass within every human heart. Be, human beings have an awareness of what is right and what is wrong. Now, it can become corrupted. Uh, it can become twisted and it, it, it could become damaged. And, you know, you can look at cultures like the Nazis or, or Marxist socialists, MS-13. Obviously, the moral compass is really warped. <clears throat> but if there was no moral compass inside of a human being, we would not have laws. We wouldn't have the need for a court system. So again, where did that come from? In the scriptures it said God has put it there. But I think people realize that there has been, there is some type of a, of a moral being who has put something in our hearts. Now, again, you have this evidence, cosmological, teleological, ontological, moral evidence. But yet man still, he, he flees. He resists uh, that God. So, I want to I want to share this with you. Somebody um, a number of years ago, I was teaching on the different evidences through nature, and somebody said to me, "None of this is evidence of a personal God, of the God of the Bible." And they're right. They're right. It's it's there's a huge difference between natural revelation and specific revelation. But I want to show you something very unique. There is an uncanny coincidence and a consistency between the God of nature and the God of the Bible. So when you begin to study specific revelation, and we'll just do this, open our Bibles, right? And you'll see what the Bible says about the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Joseph, the God of Moses, and the God of Jesus. When you see what the Bible says about that God, it is just, again, there is this harmony 
between the God of the Bible and the God of nature. So the first verse of, the, uh, of Bereshith, right? The first verse of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And there again, there is this harmony there that the God of the Bible fits right in with the God or the being that essentially created the universe or cosmology. There is this connection there between Elohim of the Bible, Elohim God here, and when we look at the universe. Another one uh, is throughout the scriptures it talks about God being omniscient, knowing all things. I, uh, Psalm 147.5, great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. And that is speaking about a God of infinite knowledge that obviously when you see all of these laws and all of these systems and all of this design, uh, the God of the Bible fits right into harmony with the God of nature. When you look at the, the ontological evidence, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, <clears throat> he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end, but it's, God has revealed himself to the human heart. And that is, again, the ontological evidence as we, we see humans, this, this human race that is predominantly religious. Right, we said 3% who claim to be atheists, and most of the atheists have huge problems with their atheism, as I did. I was a... I, when you talk about doubting Thomas, I was the doubting atheist. Couldn't explain. You know, how did something come from nothing? How does living matter come from non-living? I mean, I just I was I was in doubt all the time. And then you have moral evidence in the scriptures where God is clearly a moral being and he has created people in his image and likeness. I mean, he be holy for I am holy. God could not make that claim on people unless they had some type of moral nature. So again, there, there is this amazing comparison between what you can deduce from natural revelation to what is, again, specific revelation. And um, I, I, I say that to you because, again, there is just this harmony between the God of nature and the God of the Bible. And uh, I believe that is because the God who created all of nature is the God who gave us the Holy Scriptures. So, again, you have general revelation. Now, again, in, important. The wrath of God comes because of man's rejection of this general revelation. The general revelation then leads to rebellion. So this is where we'll begin today in, in part two. The wrath of God comes because men reject God. Okay, his revelation, cosmological, ontological, teleological, and moral. And then that leads to rebellion, and rebellion is essentially idolatry. Okay, and then that leads to moral rottenness. So in verse 22 and 23, professing to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made uh, like corruptible man, birds, four-footed animals, and creeping things. They reject Again, the revelation of God, this almighty being, this, this all-powerful being, this designer, this moral being, and they exchange it for images of men, birds, who are creeping things. And again, professing to be wise, they became fools. I mean, here's a picture of a woman worshiping a tree. Someone I talked to a couple of months ago said to me, it doesn't matter what you believe, it doesn't matter what you worship. It doesn't matter, he said, you can worship a tree because if you really believe in the tree, you're going to get power from it. That is very common today, the whole New Age movement. It doesn't matter what you believe in, it doesn't matter what, you're going to receive power. Again, professing to be wise, they became fools. This is a faith rock, you can buy them online. And people believe, again, it doesn't matter what you believe in, it doesn't matter what you worship, that if you have a faith rock and you believe it's going to give you power, it's going to give you power. And we know that a rock is nothing more than a bunch of basically inanimate, dead molecules. Professing to be wise, they became fools. 
And I often wonder that, that people who believe this stuff, not the ones who sell it, I understand about the ones who sell it. You get a bunch of rocks. How much are you paying for a bunch of rocks? You put faith on it, and you're making a bunch of money doing it. But I just have a hard time understanding the people who buy it and believe this. I think many of them, they have rocks in their heads. <laughs> Professing to be wise, they became fools. Listen to what Charles Darwin said, the founder of evolution. Why trust in a monkey's mind? But then with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of lower animals, are of any value or all, or trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? I mean, here's a man, he, he, he's doubting him very self. If I'm an evolved monkey, how can I even believe the things that I've discovered or the things that I claim to be true, these theories about evolution professing to become wise? They became fools. This is Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins is the leader. Richard Dawkins is the prophet. Richard, Dar da uh, da uh, Richard Dawkins is the herald of the God Does Not Exist movement. His purpose, he is purpose-driven and passion-driven uh, to prove that God does not exist. Uh, somebody said this, belief uh, believes life has no purpose, makes his purpose in life to convince people life has no purpose. I mean, he's purpose-driven. I want to show you an interview with him and Ben Stein. Some of you may recognize Ben Stein from... That great movie, movie, Forrest Bueller. He's the teacher in Forrest Bueller. By the way, he's a scientist. He's a brilliant man. He's actually more known today for his, um, for his uh, science. But this is him interviewing um, Richard uh, Dawkins. And um, it's a very, very interesting interview. I'm going to play it in its entirety here for about a minute and a half. Now listen to it very carefully. Because Dawkins says that, that there's no God and that he can't explain how anything happened. But watch the conclusion he comes to how life began on earth. In the book. Well, then who did create the heavens and the earth? Why do you use the word who? You see, you, you, you immediately beg the question by using the word who. Well, then how did it get created? Well, um, by a very slow process. Well, how did it start? Nobody knows how, how it started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. And what was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right, and how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, 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 no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. What do you think is the possibility that there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in, well, in evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, th that is a possibility and an intriguing possibility. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. Well, but that higher intelligence would itself have had to have come about by some explicable or ultimately explicable process. It couldn't have just jumped into existence spontaneously. That's the point. So Professor Dawkins was not against intelligent design, just certain types of designers, such as God. So the, the <laughs> Professing to be wise, they become fools? I just want to, there was one question I would have wanted to ask him after that because he's saying that some superior species came here and put us here. Okay, that's right. So how did they go from non-living matter to living matter? But understand what he, what he is teaching is what is called, and this is where evolutionists have come to. Watch this. You have to understand this. 
When you kids, a lot of you, you older folks, when you were in school, you know, they, they, they gave you the explanation how non-living matter produced living matter. Again, they couldn't explain how it happened, but non-living matter produced living matter, and suddenly you had a living molecule, and that molecule eventually evolved, and you went through all the different processes of these little squirmy things that were in the water to eventually creepy things that creeped on Earth, and suddenly arms popped out, eyes popped out, a brain popped out, and eventually it was walking upright, and it became a human being. But they can't explain how the non-living matter produced the living matter. So this is where evolution is at today. It's called transpermia. And transpermia, and by the way, I want you to understand, I am a believer in evolution. But that just turned a bunch of heads. I believe in the evolution of Darwinism. That Darwinism has evolved to the point of absolute absurdity. Okay? By the way, those who are not paying attention with what I just said, I just want you to understand what I'm saying. I do not believe in the evolutionary process. I believe God is the creator, okay? I believe in, in, in creation, in creationism. But I just want you, I want you to understand, I do believe in the evolution of, of, of Darwinism. Again, to an absolute absurd conclusion that little green men came here and they spermed the earth and that's how living beings came to be. I mean, do you understand the, the absurdity of this? Professing to be wise, they became fools. <coughs> Listen to this quote. Atheism, the belief that there was nothing and nothing happened to nothing and then nothing magically exploded for no reason, creating everything and then a bunch of everything magically rearranged itself for no reason whatsoever into self-replicating bits which then turned into dinosaurs. Makes perfect sense, right? <laughs> Professing to be wise, they became fools. And then it tells us in the second part of that verse, and changed the glory of God Right? The glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Professing to be wise, they became fools and they changed, again, the glory of the creator, the designer, into all sorts of idols. And that, again, rejection produces idolatry. Scripture, you know, again, makes it, it, it clear. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But they changed the image of God. They changed the image of the designer who has revealed himself, again, just through natural revelation as a powerful being, a genius, a moral God. And they take that and they turn it into corruptible, four-footed creatures or people that they worship. Romans 1.25 says this, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And this is the key. They exchange worship of the creator for the creature. They worship the creation instead of the creator. And when you look at mankind, again, you can see it in the Bible, you can see it in, in, you know, throughout history, and in the time we live, and if you go into the Bible, Israel, Moses on the mountain with God, he's with God, and what do the people do? He's been up there so long, they think he's not coming down, and they basically create a molten calf that they're bowing down and worshiping. Professing to be wise, they become fools. Throughout the scriptures, okay, and if you read the Old Testament, you come across all these different names. Molech. They sacrifice their kids. Manasseh, the king of Israel, sacrificed the, the future kings of Israel, his son, to Molech. Professing to be, to be wise, they become fools. Uh, you, have, you have Dagon. You have Chemosh. Uh, you have here, Baal. Uh, this is uh, Ashtoreth. This is an Ashtoreth pole. It's called in the, the book of Acts, Diana. But again, professing to be wise, people become fools. You go to the Greeks, the Greeks became very sophisticated in their gods. As, as did the, the Egyptians with their many gods. You, you go and you look at the Romans. The Romans, it was mostly the worship of people. And today, you can look at Hinduism. Hinduism claims to have literally millions of gods. And we here in America, we're more sophisticated in our gods and the choosing of our gods. I mean, you can find some people who worship statues. I mean, you, you have Mary on the half shell and a lot of them you know, in front of people's lawns. Not to, not to dishonor the, the mother of Jesus. 
But, um, you know, people have all sorts of, uh, of idols in the New Age movement. For the most part, we have different types of idols. Once, once we've rejected God, and I'll say this, once you reject God, then there's a vacuum, and you have to fill the vacuum. Because we naturally need something to make the center of our life. We need something to worship. So you look at the idols of America, they're the idols of America. It could be a career, it could be family, money, pleasure, success, comfort, possessions, power. And if you don't think people worship this stuff, man, you know, you've got to take a close look. Look at, some, look at some of the gods. How, do you think there are people who worship money? Go over and look at Wall Street. Spend a day at Wall Street and see. And you don't need to go to Wall Street. You can see, you can see it amongst, amongst money is something that people worship. How about technology? The worship, hey, look, I use technology. Okay, obviously I'm here today, I, I use a computer, I use the internet, I use PowerPoint. But my wife yells at me all the time because I put my phone down. And I leave. And sometimes I leave for the day without my phone. Can you believe that? <laughs> and one day she said to me, what happens if you get stuck on the side of the road? And I said to her, before we had those cell phones, what happened when we got stuck on the side of the road? We found a phone and we called up uh, AAA or whatever. And now... If you don't have your phone and get stuck on the side of the road, everybody's got a phone. But there's just a point where this thing is this thing. I mean, people can't put it down. They worship it. It consumes their life. How about people? Do you see people worship? I mean, celebrities and athletes and preachers, popes, dead saints. Let me just want to say something to you, my belief. I believe there are no extraordinary people on this earth. The only extraordinary person who ever walked the earth was Jesus. I believe there are ordinary people who are gifted by an extraordinary God. That is, that is what I believe. I don't, I don't get excited about celebrities. We sometimes have people come in here who have certain celebrity athletes. I, you know, I, sometimes I, I've seen churches, you know, they, 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 they post these people up and let, let them sit where they are and let them just, you know, be one of the many saints in the church and be a child of God and let them grow in the grace of God. But we, we are a, a, a world and a country, we worship people. How about sports? <clears throat> I want to I wanna show this to you. This, is, this came from a friend of mine who took off from the church one Sunday and went to a football game. And he said to me, Frank, it's a religion. And um, I just want to show you, you know, if you really look close, they even raise their hands in praise. And uh, amazingly, they pray. <laughs> and they fellowship. And their fellowship tailgating parties is, let me tell you, we can't even come close to what they do. We do our Sunday, we do our picnic. It's not even close to what they do at their, at their tailgate parties. And, and they weep and they wail and they grieve. I mean, people, when their team loses, they're depressed for weeks, sometimes for the whole year until the game, new season starts. And like all good religious people, whether they're, they're Muslims, uh, Buddhists, the Buddhists have their, you know, warriors, Sikhs, or Christianity. Christian, when Christianity becomes a religion, like all good religions, they fight. <laughs> they fight. I, I'll tell you, I don't, I don't think there was a time years ago, and I used to go to a football game, I don't think everyone went to a football game and didn't see a fight. Giant stadium, the guys in the uh, yellow suits having to come down because people are fighting all over the place. But sports becoming a... I used to watch football. I used to watch the pregame show on Friday. I used to watch pregame shows all day on Saturday. Then I would watch the 1 o'clock game, the 4 o'clock game, and then they added an evening game. Oh, wow, and I watched the evening... And then Monday night football. Now, there's even more. And God just started speaking to me and saying, hey, look, there's nothing wrong with sports. There's nothing wrong with having, you know, your favorite team. Nothing wrong with it. But it, when it becomes an obsession, it becomes your God. And I see people who are far more, to, more devoted to their sports teams than they are to Jesus. Amen. How about sex? Sex is, a, is an idol. Sex is a, is a god. The pornographic industry makes more money. Listen to this. Jose sent me this study this week. The pornographic industry takes in more money than the NFL, NBA, and MLB 
Major League Baseball combined. That's, that's, that's crazy. Was it 50% of men in the church are addicted to pornography? 50%. That's scary. How about politics? The idol of politics, the people, they, they idolize their political party. It becomes the priority, the obsession of their life. I believe that Christians should be involved in the political process. I think every one of you needs to carefully look at what the candidates believe in and vote from a Judeo-Christian perspective. Not your economic perspective, not, not your geographical advantage perspective, but from a Judeo-Christian perspective. I don't think there's anything wrong. We have, we have Rick to here, here. He's a, he's a councilman. We've had other people in politics. Anything wrong with getting involved in the political process? The Holy Spirit leads you to run for office, that's fine. But I see a lot of people who have abandoned God and politics becomes their God. And to the point of, of people, the, the Republican or the Democratic Party in this country, and boy, we need a bunch of more parties. Because there's no party going on. But people, people worship, they, you know, Marxist socialism, and Marx, when the founding of Marxist socialism, he believed that the state needed to become your God. And that's why religion became the opiate of the people. Get rid of religion, wipe it out. The very, the very tenets of, of Marxist socialism and communism is the removal of God, it's atheism. And then it, it, is, it is dialectical materialism. How about, how about the worship of our, of our political leaders? Let's look at these, I mean, Newsweek and New America. I mean, you know, you had Obama. I mean, how many people looked to, to Obama as being the Messiah? Or how many looked at, at Trump to being the Messiah? How many people looked at Be um, Bernie to being the Messiah? Again, people, people, and I saw this in the church, who were more devoted to Obama than Jesus. And they're blinded where they can't see that he's doing things that are in direct violation to a Judeo-Christian perspective as he tries to move America towards globalism. Do you realize that God established 70 nations and he established nation, national sovereignty and globalism? Do you know where it's going to lead to? The Antichrist. And that's what Nimrod tried to do at the Tower of Babel. And they're blind Christians in the church. And then the same thing goes for Trump. People so blinded by Donald Trump that, hey, you know what? They're so in favor of him that they can't see his sins. And I do like a lot of his policies. But man, you need to shut your mouth. And stop saying such stupid things. He's a man who grew up in a family. You know, he was rich. He was entitled. And I think that when you're, when you're the head of a, a, one, a $10 billion corporation, nobody ever tells you no. And maybe mommy and daddy didn't tell him no. But there's a point where you, you, you need to stop. You need to stop. But these, these, are, well, this just, these are all like, this is idolatry. This is all idolatry. How do you recognize and get rid of, uh, you know, an idol in your life? Let me just give you, I want to give you a great definition of an idol. An idol is essentially making a good thing an ultimate thing. So again, there's nothing wrong with sports, there's nothing wrong with politics, there's, there's nothing wrong with sex. I tell you, those of you who are married, go have a, as much as you want. We're not denying you that. And it's Sunday. And it's Sunday. Sunday is the Lord's Day. You should have Shabbat, Shabbat sex on Sundays. There's nothing wrong with a career, nothing wrong with a business. But again, when it becomes the priority of your life and, and essentially the ultimate thing in your life, it becomes idolatry. And you begin to worship the creation instead of worshiping the creator. And you start to love it more than you love God. And it blinds you. Now, the rejection of God leads to rebellion. And rebellion leads to rotting. And for the remainder of Romans 1, it's all about a rotting. A rotting of the human soul and a rotting of culture. So in, in verse 24 and 25, it says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. And let me tell you, three times it says this. This is frightening stuff. God gave up on them. He gave them up 
he, he abandoned them. I want to I just say something to you here, just to stress this. I don't believe that it, it means that these people can't be saved. I believe if they repent, they can be saved. Some of us are going to see that we've been, we've been in this place. So I just want to stress that. But there's a point where the wrath of God is the sin that they're getting entrenched in. Do you understand? A lot of times, again, we're looking at somebody who's living just a, a wretched life. We're waiting. Well, you know, God's just going to come down and zap them with a lightning bolt. No, the, the very wretched life. That is the wrath of God. Their rejection of Him and their rebellion has caused them to fall into this rottenness of the human nature. And it says, it says therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. The word is epithemia, and it means lust gone wild. So in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever and amen. So verse 20, 25 and 26, watch this again. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Do you know what that's saying? The homosexual relationship is the very wrath. They give up the natural for the unnatural. It's the idea here of an alteration of something that was meant originally, its original course, its original meaning, its original state, and distorting it. A corruption of what God had originally intended, a perversion of what God had originally intended. So here, here's the picture. This is what God intended. This is natural. A man with a woman in the marriage covenant. Now, you'll notice something very unique about a man and a woman, how their bodies naturally fit together like two pieces of a puzzle. Have you ever noticed that? They fit. So, when the man and the woman come together uh, and they're married, they fit together, they engage in the most powerful thing that we as human beings can engage in. Do you know what that is? It's not prayer. It, it's the two shall become one flesh. And that's not just talking about a fun time in the sack. The two becoming one flesh is that you have two unique people creating the image and likeness of God who have unique DNA who come together and they share that DNA and they become co-creators with God and they create another human being who shares in both mommy and daddy's DNA. You understand why God finds that that is such a significant and important thing that it should always be done in a place of security between two committed people because now they have a responsibility of this child to raise them up. This is unnatural. This is not what God intended. By the way, you get people saying, well, you know what? Homosexuals are born that way. There is nothing that has ever been discovered in science, anything to do with DNA, genes, or anything to do with neurotransmitters in the brain that shows that homosexuals are born that way. In fact, there are eight studies, and you can find them online. You actually can find them all together on, one, um, on online. There have been eight studies done on identical twins, the exact same DNA, the exact same genetics, one chooses homosexuality, one chooses heterosexuality. It's a choice. Those studies have been done in Scandinavia, the United States, and Australia. It proves that it's a choice. This is not the natural way. This is natural. It's a beautiful thing. Marriage between a man and a woman. Throughout history, from the very beginning, we have 6,000 years of recorded human history. That's what we have. I always used to puzzle me as, as an evolutionist and as an atheist. All of a sudden, civilization just popped up out of nowhere. Civilization, arts, um, culture, government suddenly popped up out of nowhere 6,000 years ago. And um, before that, I mean, you know, we were just grunting in caves, pulling our women by the hair, right?
By the way, I, I believe the earth, I believe the earth is billions of years old. I do believe that. If you come here on a Wednesday night, we went through the book of Genesis, I, I believe that. I believe we as we are have only been here a few thousand years. But you have civilization pop up and one of the things of civilization popping up was marriage between a husband and a wife. And you can see that in the Babylonian culture, in the Sumerian culture, in the Jewish culture, you can see it in the Egyptian culture. This is married between, that's, that's the natural order. This is an unnatural order. The rainbow. That is God's sign in the sky of his peace. We live in a, a time of peace right now on this earth. That is, that is God's sign. He paints it up there. This is unnatural. They have stolen God's sign. They corrupted it. By the way, no matter how hard they try, they can't paint it in the sky. They ain't going to do that. On June 26, 2015, the Supreme Court redefined marriage. No longer is it between a man and a woman. I mean, a, 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 a woman and a man and a man and a woman. Now, they redefined it that it can be between a man and a man and a woman and a woman. And uh, our president had the White House lit up in a rainbow. That is unnatural. It is a rebellion against God and it brings wrath. In verse 28 through 32 you have this list of sins. And even as they did not retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over, third time, to a debased mind. To do those things which are not fitting. Now, again, not to pick on the homosexuals. Because look at some of the sins that are listed here that people get entrenched in. To do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, uh, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgments of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. And what is that? That is a picture of moral rottenness. See that can? That's filled with moral rottenness. <laughs> it's filled with... Uh, Maggots. Now, I want, to, I want you to just to see something here, and I want, you to, I want to just say something here. I am not here pointing my finger at, at, I'm, I'm not here pointing my finger at homosexuals. I'm not here pointing my finger at anybody who is, who is just entrenched in any of these sins. Because what we're going to see next week, the first verse of Romans chapter 2, therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, Whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself for you who judge practice the same things. And I think if we're all honest and we look at some of those sins, some of us would say, hey, I committed some of those this week. Now watch. I want to take you through this. God gave them over to a debased mind. That's a mind that has lost its value. When they debase a currency, they lower the, the uh, value of the currency. A debased mind is a mind that's lost its value. It's lost its sense of right and wrong. So God gave them over to a debased mind. And then it says, being filled with all unrighteousness. This is important, being filled, being dominated. There's no room for God's righteousness. When, it, when a Christian... Okay, when a Christian is tempted, a true Christian, there will be some resistance even though they may fall. A true Christian who sins will have a sense of repentance. That's one thing that I noted. When I got saved, it wasn't that I was living this holy, perfect life. I still sinned and I still have sinned. But when I sin, I feel bad about it and I repent. While before, I didn't care. Man, I'm fornicating, right? I don't, I don't, I don't care. I'm cursing. I don't care. Blaspheming God. I don't care. But when I became a Christian, suddenly I got conviction. So there's a difference between a Christian and somebody who is filled with all unrighteousness. So to speak, a, a Christian, sin becomes the exception. And righteousness, the norm. The person who is filled with all unrighteousness, sin is the norm. And righteousness is a rare exception. So he talks here again. He goes and talks about the sin of immorality. And the sin of immorality, sexual immorality. 
Uh, premarital sex, adultery, homosexuality, incest, orgies, bestiality, pedophilia, pornography. And again, if, if, if I'll be honest with you, I have committed some of these sins. Before I was a Christian and married, I engaged in premarital sex. Okay? Uh, adultery. Now, I, I have never committed adultery on my wife physically, but Jesus said, if you think an adulterous thought, you've done it. Guilty. Guilty. Homosexuality. No, you don't got me on that one. <laughs> I have never even had a, a one second homosexual thought in my whole life. I just want you to know that. And I'm not boasting because some of these others I've committed. So again, I, I don't want to stand here as, as the judge. I've fallen. Let me just tell you something interesting about, about these sins. There are right now over 200 sexually transmitted diseases in people in the United States. One out of two people who are sexually active by the time they're 25, will get one of these sexually transmitted diseases. And let me tell you, some of them are really painful. And um, some of them will stick with you the rest of your life. And some of them cause infertility in women. And some of them can cause death. And you know what's neat about all these diseases? In a monogamous marriage, you can't get them. Isn't that interesting? In a monogamous marriage, you cannot get one of those. Wickedness. The word used here denotes a desire of injuring others. Just, just people want to hurt others. Look at some of these groups. I always wonder when people wear masks. Ku Klux Klan wears masks. Antifa wears masks. I'm not worried about anybody who has to wear a mask. And we should outlaw masks in the United States. We really should. You're going to hide behind a mask. You're not allowed to walk on the street. Groups that just go out. They just want to hurt people. Look at, look at MS-13. I heard a story about a boy, a 10-year-old kid in Germany who was raped by two Afghani immigrants who were 11 years old. And they brutally raped a 10-year-old boy. I mean, that's just sick. Kids, I mean, when, when I think of myself when I was 11 years old, I, I didn't know what any of that was. Covetousness. The desire to obtain what belongs to others. It's the Ten Commandments. It's, it's like, hey, I have to have that fish. I'm not happy with mine. Look at this, look at this kid looking at this girl's ice cream cone, right? <laughs> I have to have what they have. I won't be complete unless I get what they have. I got to have the house. I got to have the salary. I got to have the money. And, and there's, 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 there's organizations. They just prey on people with this stuff. Maliciousness. Uh, kakia. The desire to do evil. Evil from the heart. It's a, it's a heart that is essentially evil. You look at the, the terrorist, Bin Laden, and the terrorist who blew up the, uh, the World Trade Center in the Pentagon. Shanksville, uh, Shanksville, Pennsylvania. How about what just happened recently with all of these Catholic priests? And you get into that story and it's sick. These guys were plotting. They got one girl pregnant and they made her have an abortion. And that they do is they give certain kids a certain crucifix and that identify that child as prey to the other pedophile priests. And when the archdiocese found out and was reported to Rome, all they did was they just moved them to another parish. A cover-up. And the Pope still will not recommend that a pedophile priest is immediately reported to the police. Just amazing. Full of envy. That's pain, uneasiness, or dis, uh, discontent, excited by another's prosperity, accompanied with some degree of hatred. People, again, who become envious and jealous of what someone else has. Murder. Taking of a human life with premeditated malice by a person of a sane mind. Did you see this guy? He killed a cop out in California. And while the cop's family stood in the courtroom, he looked at them and smiled and he said, I love killing cops. Strife, contention connected with anger and heated zeal. We see that, we see that in our, our country. We see, it, we see it in our political system. Deceit denotes uh, fraud, falsehood, lying to advance one's position. How about, how about these people? 
We, we get shocked by Bernie Madoff. We, we look at, at the deceit of, I've been you know, saying this since the 80s. Trump comes out and he says, he says, fake news, fake, I've been saying fake news since the 1980s. It's fake. It's built upon having to sell time and to get sponsors to come in and sponsor the program. So it's all hype. It's all exaggeration. And it's all deception. How about preaching for money? But just most of the average, I look at this one, this one average, I put it on the right, build 30% more muscle mass in less than 30 days. It ain't happening. But dumb people fall for these things. Just pure deception. Evil-mindedness. Again, it's, it's a mind that is essentially evil, that plots evil, that plans evil. Somebody, somebody came to me a couple weeks ago and goes, Pastor, why are you so against socialism? Why are you so against socialism? Let me show you, can, can I show you why? Here, here's why. Because every one of these men were leftists, socialists, Marxists, atheists. Let me throw another one in there. Gun control advocates. They disarm the populace and then they can control them. Look at the scriptures. Whenever any of the evil people took over Israel, they disarmed them. They murdered these four account for over 50 million people murdered in the previous century. There's Stalin, you got Marx, you got Pot, and you got Hitler, Mao. I'm sorry, I said Marx, but uh, well, he's in there too. Whisperers. Whisperers are character assassins, not somebody who's over in church saying, let me just tell you what's going on fast, and that's not what a whisperer is. Whisperers are, are essentially people, they whisper, they assassinate people's characters. The ACLU recently released and said, Christians are as bad as ISIS. And um, CNN said that Donald Trump is worse than the 9-11 terrorists. Well, you may not like him, but I think that's a little bit of a gross exaggeration, wouldn't you say? And this is the time of character assassinations. You, you, look, you look at the great, the great assassins, right? You can go to John Wilkes Booth. You, you can look at Lee Harvey Oswald. You can look at Sir, you know, Sir Han, Sir Han, and the, the killer of, of Martin Luther King. They were assassins. Today, you have the media as assassins. You have political activists are, are assassins. You have politicians are assassins. That will just, they will lie, they will, they will slander, they will gossip, they will attack, just totally false. You know, here's, here's what you do. If you, want to, if you want to destroy somebody, just call them a racist. They don't have to be a racist. Just call them a racist, you'll destroy them. Call them a pedophile, just make it up. And it, it's, 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 just, it's just, the end justifies the means. That you can use any means, lying, deceiving, treachery, gossip, slander. You can use any means, libel, to destroy a person if they are in the way of your agenda, your political agenda, your global agenda. And that's the time we live in. So these were assassins who, kill, who killed our leaders. But there's assassins all over the place. Just, just turn on the news. Carefully orchestrated assassinations every night on the news. Backbiters and slanderers. And backbiters and slanderers goes right along with the whisperers. Haters of God. Here's a, here's a, a gathering. Impeach God. During the Democratic Convention in 2015, I saw this. And this was at 5 o'clock right before I was coming to church. This really, this really shocked me. It came to the platform of the Democratic Convention that they wanted the name of God removed from the Democratic platform. And when, I think he was the mayor of Los Angeles, who was the um, narrator, he had to take a vote. And they had to take the vote three times because it seemed that there were more people who wanted God removed than there were people who wanted God to remain. And he was having an anxiety attack, freaking out, because he knew if they removed God from the platform, they were gonna lose a whole lot of God-fearing people from voting for their candidates. By the way, the Republican Party has its problems. I think that's why you have to look at the candidate and closely look at what their views are. And do they match up to a Judeo-Christian ethic? 
Uh, look at these people. Protest. If Mary had an abortion, we wouldn't be in this mess. Pro-abortion rally. That's just shocking. We're, we are a culture that is violent. I mean, our, our video games, our, our, our movies, we, we are a, a, cultural, a culturally violent society. Now, I said this a couple weeks ago, Las Vegas takes bets on how many people are going to die in Chicago every weekend. Pride. A people who, you know, walk around in their pride. You know what, you, the, the, the sin of pride is simply, I'm better than you because. I'm better than you because I'm... Uh, more educated. I'm better than you because I'm wealthier. I'm better than you because I live in a nicer neighborhood. I'm better than you because I graduated from this, from this school. I'm, I'm better than you because of this or that. I'm better than you because of my religion. It's a disease that leads to worse and worse sins. Boasting, again, would, would fit right in with pride. The person there boasting. They have to tell the world how wonderful they are, how many trophies they have. Inventors of, of, of evil things. People who just, they, 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 they invent ways of evil. Do you know who this woman is? She's pretty much the, the mama of the modern abortion movement, Margaret Sanger. She is the, the founder of Planned Parenthood who said, we want to exterminate the Negro population. By the way, Latinos were second, Jews were third. Eventually they're going to get to the Italians. <laughs> you just understand, they are. The Ku Klux Klan, the Nazis, eventually they're going to come, they're going to come for, for us. We want to exterminate the Negro population. Let me just ask you something. Have you ever noticed how Planned Parenthood is always in African-American neighborhoods? Well, here we are in Bergen County. Where are the two abortion mills in Bergen County? In Englewood and Hackensack. Isn't that strange? Because in all the white neighborhoods you don't find an abortion mill. Abortion right now takes the lives of about 35% of, of African-Americans. Then the second group that's taken are um, Latinos. The third group is whites. And then the last group is uh, Asians. There's a lot less Asians in America too. But just, I, I don't know if you ever stopped and looked at that. Her goal was to genocide minorities. She felt that they were useless, that they, they were of lower intelligence, that they were essentially a disease on the culture. Disobedient to parents, right? Under, uh, uh, undiscerning, lack of ability to know right and wrong. I mean, people, their, their, their moral compass is absolutely messed up. I don't know what's right and wrong. It depends on the situation. As long as I don't get caught. Uh, untrustworthy. Let me show you, show you this statistic. This is interesting. The most trusted people in our culture, nurses... Military offices, grade school teachers, medical doctors. Some of you feel real good. Look at the bottom. Lobbyists, business executives, lawyers, TV reporters, local uh, office holders, newspaper reporters, bankers, clergy. We're, we're smack in the middle. And I don't blame them. When you see what's happened in the Catholic Church, when you see the faith preachers on television. If you're a nurse, you're feeling really good today, right? You got edified. If you're a lobbyist, not so good. Unloving. Right? Just unloving to our, to our fellow man. There's a guy walking down the street, stepping over the homeless. Couldn't even care. <coughs> Unforgiving. Unmerciful. They approve uh, of those who practice them. You ever see that? Like, it's a culture that cheers on the, the, the people who are in rebellion. It cheers on the rebels. It cheers on the sinners. Look, look, look at the parades, right? The crowds on the sidelines are more than the people who are marching down the street. So when God gave men up and the giving up of men, this frightening statement. I've had people come to me and say, do you think God has given up on me? Like I'm just having such a hard time praying. I'm having such a hard time just believing that God loves me. He's having such a hard time. When God gave men up, that is the wrath of God. That is his wrath. Again, you, if you're waiting for lightning bolts to come down, they may come down at some time, but I'll tell you this. This is the judgment. It is, it is the wrath of God that has come upon people who have rejected him, rebelled against him, and they've experienced this rottenness. 
The scary thing about the time we live in, it not only happens to individuals, it happens to cultures, to nations, and to a world. Chuck Missler, my, my very beloved teacher who went home to be with the Lord this year, and I don't know if there's anybody who's had a greater influence on me in my life, really, as I come down to it, than Chuck Missler. And um, Chuck, when he wore the American flag, he wore it upside down. He's an ex-military guy, and he served, he served basically on eight military companies, but when he wore the American flag, he would wear it upside down. Why do you wear an American flag upside down? It's not to dishonor the American flag. It's a distress signal. And when people would go up to Chuck and say, why are you wearing American flag upside down? He would say, it is because I believe America is in tremendous distress. We are in distress. You look, you look at our, our, our country and, I mean, let me tell you, our political system is in shambles. Right now, right now, listen to what I'm saying to you. You could take the extreme left and the extreme right and you could have a civil war in this country. Put one on one side. I'm telling you, armed, guns, shooting, killing. The blood is... We, we, I'll tell you, if, if we don't get a hold of this, we're going to see it. Our prisons are overflowing. We can't keep up with our prison population and we're basically we're building more and more prisons. We, we imprison more people than any nation on earth. More than China. And their population is, is four times greater than ours. 51% of children are born out of wedlock, 50% of, of marriages, right? We're still at, at, at divorce rate. Jo, uh, General Douglas MacArthur said this, history fails to record a single precedent in which nations subject to moral decay have not passed into political and economic decline. There has been either a spiritual awakening to overcome the moral lapse or a progressive deterioration leading to the ultimate national disaster. Folks, we, we need to wake up and begin to pray. You need to begin to pray for your country. You need to be praying for your leaders. You need to pray that, that people would turn to righteousness and away from evil. We have, we have leaders here in our church, who are, again, political leaders. We have policemen, in, a number of policemen in our church. We need to be praying for them. They're, deal, they're, dealing with, I mean, this, they're dealing with stuff that we never imagined they'd have to deal with in these last years. So again, you have wrath... And wrath comes because of rejection, which then produces rebellion and then produces rotting. So I, want to give you, I just want to give you a final application here. If you look at your Bibles, and this is, this is key to understanding what we have looked at this last, and I'm going to end right here. Romans chapter 1, 17 and 18. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So you, if, if you look at that and you look at it carefully, right, that is a choice to put your faith in the gospel of Christ. And you are either living there in the gospel of Christ or in verse 18 and everything that follows, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And that's, that, that, that's our choice. We either are living by faith in the gospel of Christ, believing that He is our God, that He is our Savior, that He is our Lord, believing in His Word, believing that He died on that cross to take our sins and was raised from the dead, or you're living in a place of rebellion, and that is the wrath of God. So that's a, that's a choice that you make. And if you've heard anything in these last two weeks, you've heard anything today, make that choice for Jesus. Receive the gospel of, of the Lord into your life. So would you all bow your heads? We'll close in prayer.